When 30-year-old Travis Alexander closed his bedroom door on June 4, 2008, he assumed that whatever happened behind that door would remain between him and his guest. He also assumed he would walk out that door alive. But that very private rendezvous has now become very public. Hey, down to the jury. In fact, the details of what happened in this community on the edge of a desert and how that tryst turned into bloody murder have been at the heart of the most sensational and stunning courtroom drama this year. Now to that dramatic testimony in the Jody Arias murder trial. How does she get to tweet from behind bars? Jody Arias speaks out. The trial of Jody Ann Arias, the woman America loves to hate. A 32-year-old femme fatale with made-for-TV looks, accused of slashing, stabbing, and shooting to death her ex-boyfriend, Travis Alexander, a young up-and-coming businessman active in the Mormon church. Five years after the crime, the secrets of that bathroom have finally bubbled to the surface, some written in blood, some captured by photograph, others from the mouth of an admitted killer. Did you kill Travis Alexander on June 4th, 2008? Yes, I did. I a story breathlessly told by correspondents. It's all anybody in this town is talking about. Local minstrels with Jody-inspired ballads. Now Jody is a narcissist in the end degree. And even internet parodies. Miss Harris, do you have a problem with your memory? I don't remember. But just two days ago, the verdict. We, the jury, do find the defendant as to count one first-degree murder guilty. Eight men and four women who listened patiently through months of raunch and religion found Arius guilty of first-degree murder. The crowds that gathered physically and virtually to follow the case seem to agree. Thank God she got it! But back in 2008, police were just arriving at a crime scene. Travis Alexander was dead. The wounds on his body so numerous, investigators couldn't even count them at the scene. The medical examiner eventually tallied the inventory of violence. 27 stab wounds, a deep cut to the throat, and a gunshot wound to the head. And his friends said they knew just who did it. Jody Arias. As soon as we found out he was dead, Almost everyone I know said Jody did it. This is the only woman with enough hate and venom in her life to do this to Travis. It began so differently. They met working for a legal insurance company. Travis was 29, very successful, an elder in the Mormon church, known for its strict policies against premarital sex. Jody was 26, an aspiring photographer and looking for Mr. Wright. And for a little while, it looked like she'd found him. She was popular with everybody, with everybody. People flocked around Jody. She was very quiet, very mysterious. But uh, very polite. Yeah, very nice, very sweet. Everybody liked her and uh, thought originally it'd be a good fit for Travis. Jody plunged headfirst into Travis's world. Just weeks into their friendship, she was baptized in the Mormon church, Travis at her side. To the outside world, they were a chaste Mormon couple. But behind the facade of faith and chastity, illicit passion. Jody wanted nothing but to please Travis. It really appeared like they were involved in a very loving relationship. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because in reality, Jody was Travis's dirty little secret. There was a five-month window where they were dating and they were serious, but this was the girl he was going to have sex with. This was the girl that was going to keep his bed warm until he married a proper Mormon girl. And yet, she stays in his life and in his bed. She moved just a few miles from Travis in Mesa. The temptation was even greater. Jody wrote in her journal. His bedroom becomes our playground, where our passions run wild and certain fantasies are taken to the extreme. The rules melt away. Travis, torn by his religious beliefs, decided to end the relationship. But somehow, even as he started dating other Mormon girls, Jody and Travis secretly kept seeing each other. Why are you still acting as his booty call? I was making a string of bad choices during that time in my life. 
Listen to this tape recording from one of their phone calls. If you were here, my grandparents were asleep. I'd let you ride in my bedroom. We'd shut and lock the door, and we would just have a big bet. You'd go at it all night. But to his friends, Travis said they are done and painted Jody as a jealous stalker. He was saying things like, you know, you have no reason to be in Mesa. We're not together. We're not going to be together. Um, why are you there? You know, why can't you leave me alone? In fact, just weeks before his death, Travis told Jody Arias he had invited another woman to go with him on a trip to Cancun, Mexico. Everyone in his life knew Jody was obsessed with him. He told everyone in his life, and they were all aware of this woman. So were police, now that he'd been found butchered in what appears to be a very personal crime. But the lead investigator, Mesa Detective Esteban Flores, didn't have to go looking for Jody. She came looking for him. Jody Arias calls the authorities. That takes a lot of gumption. Well, this is part of the cover-up. What have you heard so far? Nobody's been able to get a hold of him for almost a week, and that was about the last time I spoke to him, too. I used to live there. I live in Northern California now. You haven't been back in town since then? Since I moved, no, I haven't. Very quickly, however, police learn that, in fact, Jody had been at the house. It became very clear uh, to the authorities early on that she was there. The detective, as he's exiting the house, he passes through the laundry room and he sees a red smear on the washing machine. Inside, the clue that will unlock this entire case. These are inadvertent photographs, accidental photographs. These are photographs that the killer did not want taken. And the Jody Arias interview you've never seen before. Arias, J-O-D-I-A-R-I-A-S. I guess I've seen better days, but that'll have to do. Stay with us. Twelve hours into Travis Alexander's homicide investigation, and detectives had a lot of blood and a lot of fingers pointed at Jody Arias, Travis's on and off ex girlfriend, who, according to friends, was a full on stalker. But what detectives needed was proof she was there, and they're about to find it in an unlikely place. Inside the washing machine, still wet from the rinse cycle, was Travis's camera. On the data card stored in the memory, time-stamped photos from the day Travis was killed. On June 4th, at 1.42, Mr. Alexander was very much alive. And not only was he very much alive, he was involved in these photographs with a woman. And who was that woman? One Jody Arias, now a brunette posing in pigtails. The photos tell the story of an afternoon of prolonged passion. These were all taken between 1 and 2 p.m. that day. These photos were taken around 5. But less than two minutes after Travis posed for this haunting picture, the camera captures this. A series of inadvertent photos caused by a design flaw in the camera. In this one, the camera appears to be falling to the ground, a shot of the bathroom ceiling. And then this one, a foot alongside Travis's bloody body. They were able to retrieve these photos and they somehow, miraculously, don't just tell the story before and after, but during and also provides, most importantly, a time frame when the actual crime occurred. And there is another critical clue, a bloody palm print on the wall just down the hall from the bathroom, where investigators believe Travis was dragged back to the shower. Lab tests reveal that, too, belonged to Jody. And there's more. One week before the killing, a break-in at the area's grandparents' home. One of the items missing? A 25 caliber gun. The same caliber used to shoot Travis. Coincidence or criminal cunning on Jody's part? The burglar, the person who went in there. Right there. It's Jody Arias. That's the burglar. And she needs a gun. And she needs a gun to kill Travis Alexander. It was time for a chat with Ms. Arias. Investigators headed to Wairica, California, a thousand miles from Mesa, Arizona, and arrested her outside her grandparents' home. They brought her here to the local sheriff's office. 
Travis, you remember me? Of course I do. Yeah, I've been working on Travis's case ever since it happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know a lot of details. Okay. Because I believe that you know some of these details. Okay. And I think you can help us. I would love to help you in any way that I can. Okay. When you watch the tapes of her interrogation, what strikes you most? She seems completely unflappable. And this goes to why she's such a good liar and potentially a good witness. A good liar? Try Casey Anthony caliber champion liar. Listen to this. Were you at Travis's house on Wednesday? Absolutely not. I was, I was nowhere near Mesa. I wasn't even close to him. What if I could show you proof you were there? Would well, that change your mind? I was not at Travis's house. I was not. You were at Travis's house. You guys had a sexual encounter, which there's pictures. I know you know there's pictures because I have them. She's very masterful at sounding very, very believable and very innocent. If Travis were here today, he would tell you that it wasn't me. She seems very genuine in what she's saying, and we know now it's a lie. I've never Why, heard Travis? You did. I'm not guilty. I didn't hurt Travis. If I hurt Travis, if I killed Travis, I would beg for the death penalty. Getting nowhere, the detective shifts gears and hits Jody with the evidence. That's you. I wanted to cover you up because... Oh. That's you. All of you. That looks like me. But this one, I don't know if I should show you. But it's just one of the photos that was taken by accident. That's your foot, Jody. That's Travis. This is his bathroom. That is not my foot. But this may be even tougher to explain. You should have your makeup, Jody. While Jody waited, she didn't seem like a normal person facing potential murder charges. <laughs> she seemed, well, off the wall. The next day, after a night in jail and a wardrobe change, Jody was back in the hot seat. But this time, she admitted she was at the house when the killing happened. I was like right here on my knees in his bathtub is right here. She told the detective that masked intruders broke in and attacked her and Travis. I think I got knocked out, but I don't think it was that long. There were two people there. One was a guy and one was a girl. What did they say? Yeah, the girl wanted to kill me too. Why, why didn't they kill you? He said that's not what we're here for. She said she tried to help a badly injured Travis. I came back this way, pushed her, and he said, go to my neighbors, go to my neighbors. And he's like, I can't feel my legs. And they wouldn't let me be by him. The police didn't buy Jody's story. The so many inconsistencies that I don't even want to deal with right now. But it turned out there were plenty of people who wanted to hear it. And Jody was more than happy to oblige jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent, and you can mark my words on that one. One of the cameras Jody sat down before was ours. Okay. Do you have a mirror? <laughs> you are watching never-before-seen footage of Jody in 2008, just after her arrest. Born and raised in California. Portraying herself as a family girl. I have a large family. We're all pretty close. A loving girlfriend. He made me feel like a very beautiful person on the inside. And an innocent victim. All of the evidence, to me, is very compelling, but none of it proves that I committed a murder. If this were something that, you know, that I, that I could have done, and it, it would be scary times, I think, spiritually and, you know, thinking of what lies beyond this. What lies beyond is the answer to the ultimate question. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand you have reached a verdict. Two stories. Which story do you want to believe? Two minutes between an intimate moment and a stabbing frenzy. She gets a knife and stabs him in the chest. And that's when it starts. What really happened in that bathroom? That is almost certainly what killed him. For four and a half long years, Jody Arias sat in this Phoenix jail. After dozens of media interviews, the chatty and seemingly confident murder suspect was now on a different stage, facing a very different audience. Twelve jurors who will decide her fate. Prosecutor Juan Martinez's case for first degree is clear. If Jody couldn't have Travis, she decided no one else would. He says it's the worst thing that's ever happened to him. 
And that's true. She couldn't let him go. This is exhibit 237.001. The veteran prosecutor laid out a sinister tale, a paper trail of premeditation left by the defendant, including getting gas cans and turning off her cell phone so she couldn't be traced as she traveled from California to Arizona with murder on her mind. But the crux of the state's case was here, in this bathroom. What happened between this photo to this photo, the camera flying through the air? She takes this haunting, beautiful last picture of him and then sets the camera down and what? Whips out a knife and a gun and begins attacking him? We don't know what transpired between Jody Arias and Travis Alexander that day. Did he tell her it was over? Did all her anger at being his dirty little secret, warming his bed until a better girl came along, suddenly erupt? Or had she plotted this for weeks after he told her he was taking that other woman to Cancun? Each side, the prosecution and the defense, would tell very different stories of what happened next. Renowned trial lawyer Kathleen Zellner has agreed to walk 2020 through the defense case, although she does not agree with its theory. And she testifies they come back into the bathroom. Yes. Travis gets in the shower. Exactly. So he gets into the shower and she begins snapping photographs of him. He's posing, and then she drops his camera on the floor. Okay, and that enrages him, she Enrages testifies. him. So she claims he comes out, and he lunges at her, uh, flips her over mm -hmm. in a body slam. She recovers from it, though, and takes off down the hall. She claims now she's in fear of her life. Okay, and so she runs this way, according right. to her testimony, and then back into the closet. Exactly, because she remembers that his gun supposedly is in the closet. She grabs the gun. It's a 25 caliber. She continues out this door. Runs into the bathroom. Correct. To the middle of the bathroom, right. at which point she turns around. Right. And he's down like a linebacker. She demonstrated that. Shoots him right temple through the left cheek. And then after that, she remembers nothing. She doesn't remember slitting his throat or stabbing him 27 times. She has amnesia. According to Arias, this wasn't the first time Travis had snapped. Over 18 days of testimony, Jody Arias defames her dead lover, claiming he degraded her. He called me a skank. Abused her repeatedly. He called me a bitch and he kicked me in the ribs and got on top of me and started choking me. And exposed her to his alleged secret perversion. I walked in and Travis was on the bed masturbating. Um, he started grabbing at something on the bed, and it was a photograph. What was the photograph of? It was a picture of a little boy. But the defense cannot produce a single witness to corroborate these claims. And the prosecution says these are all just more wild and desperate tales from an admitted liar. We know the sequence is completely false, and that's why she has amnesia. You're saying that Jody's version of events doesn't match the forensic evidence It in this absolutely case. does not. Jody Arias is one of the greatest liars ever. Dan Abrams, legal analyst for ABC News, makes the case for the prosecution. So she's taking photos of him and asks for one final picture where he's looking directly into the camera. And at some point, the prosecution says she gets a knife. That's right. And stabs him in the chest. And that's when it starts. And he staggers to the sink, mm -hmm. somehow gets here, puts his hands on the sink, coughs up blood on the mirror, trying to sort of balance himself. And at the same time, she continues stabbing him, according to the prosecution, in the middle of his back. The attack yeah. continued. The attack continues. You've got the wounds in the front and in the back. And then he somehow continues to try to get away. Down this long hallway. Again, somehow staggering probably not that quickly. And then around here, right at the edge of the bedroom, he collapses. And at this point, she slits his throat from ear to ear, according to prosecution. And we know this because there's a massive blood stain on the carpet and in this location. They believe that is what killed him. At this point, she then decides to drag him back into the bathroom. He's 5'9", 180 pounds. She's 5'4", weighs much less. And to balance herself, she puts her hand up on the wall and at that point leaves a bloody palm print. Very important piece of evidence because that's what placed her at the scene definitively 
in addition to the photographs. And she manages, even though he's so much bigger and heavier than she is, to drag him all the way back this long hallway, all the way back into the bathroom. And this is where we find the shell casing. So he was shot at some point in the bathroom. They're not certain. Did it occur earlier? Did it occur later? But we know that that shot occurred somewhere in this area. And then she's able to drag his body back into the shower where the attack began, where she turns on the shower in an effort to clean up? That's what they believe. Shot in self-defense or stabbed as part of a premeditated cold-blooded murder. Please stand for the jury. It took just 15 hours of deliberation for the jury to decide. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn, do find the defendant guilty. As relatives wept and crowds cheered, Arius looked into the eyes of the jury that will now decide whether she lives or dies. In an interview she granted with a local station, she says she would rather face death. I said years ago that I'd rather get death than life, and that still is true today. If I hurt Travis, if I killed Travis, I would beg for the death penalty. Arius is now on suicide watch. She says she wishes she could take it all back. I have a million regrets. I wish that it was just a nightmare that I could wake up from. And for the relatives of Travis, that's perhaps as close to an apology as Jody Arias will ever come.